Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to our series on ancient Greece. And uh, we've had just a few days off for you to uh, think about some of the things that we studied a week or so ago, and we're ready to uh, progress quite rapidly over the next five or six days in terms of number of presentations. So we hope that you'll join us uh, today. Uh, this hour we have two speakers, one in the next hour, and then tomorrow and Friday are a full round of uh, sessions. So we hope that you will join us there. It's quite a pleasure to have a speaker that is um, named for one of the islands in the Greek chain, and uh, she's here. She's flown in from across the quad and uh, will entertain and educate us. But first, I will let uh, Dr. Wabi introduce her. Thank you very much, Dr. Dean Lana. Well, welcome to this uh, round of the Ancient Greece Symposium in the futuristic look. What we are going to do is to look back to Greeks and see how did they eat and laugh and so forth. And uh, for those of you who are expecting the technology, it will come next in a few minutes. And uh, I, I like to play with the words when Kathy uh, presents. And I wanted to say, what did eats Greek? <laughs> <laughs> just to have something to laugh at and start our laughter, ancient laughter. Thank you. Um, I am Kathy Rhodes, and I teach in Family Consumer Sciences, and I just think it's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to speak about the, what Greeks ate back in ancient Greece. Um, it wasn't really exciting what they ate. I mean, it's about the same as what they eat today. Um, it evolved over many, many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, what, what uh, came into play today as to what was back in ancient Greece. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little quick overview. Um, we're going to talk about the foods they ate and what is specific to Greece, what types of vessels they cooked in and how it was cooked, um, healthy versus non-healthy. Mm. And did you know, there's a couple little things that maybe you didn't know that uh, was... Uh, uh, specific to Greece of a uh, different thing. So let's begin. And foods they ate. I'm going to ask uh, Todd to do this. I have to. I'm not one to stand in one position too long. I have to get out and talk to everyone. So over the years, there's not many changes been made in the Greek foods. Um, for the most part, they ate then now what they ate then. Uh, very similar to uh, what was grown and what they what they were able to grow and what they killed, what the animals they killed they, they got they, they ate as well. Um, they ate pretty much the same thing. I covered that. The, the meats, poultry, fish, seafood, uh, those found locally are beef, lamb, goat, pork, and poultry game. Um, the fish included cod, red mullet, mackerel, sea bass, and, and others, as you can say, uh, different varieties, soft shell varieties of uh, uh, crab and lobster and many others. Um, so olive oil is specific to Greece. I know a lot of you think maybe the Italians uh, um, invented the olive oil. No, not really. If you look at this, it was made, it's made around the world. However, the Greek olive oil is a little different. It's, uh, it's a true treasure and taste can't be duplicated. Any place in the whole world, the Greek olive oil cannot be duplicated. It has a special taste all on its own. And the sugar that, that is used in Greece is specific to Greece. It's made out of beet sugar, or, or uh, yeah, the beet sugar. And uh, it makes a difference. Um, yeah, does it make a difference? It's a divided de uh, decision. Sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. In cooking, you know, whether to use cane sugar or beet sugar. In the United States, I think we have 12 states um, that grow uh, beets. And in the United States, we also have four states that are specific to cane sugar. So uh, we do import some of our beet sugars in, which is quite expensive. You know, and there's a tariff tax on that. I mean, it just goes, you know, you can get, really get into politics with the, with the sugar uh, thing there. Salt. Um, Greeks tend to use sea salt. Most of the recipes, traditional Greek recipes, are, um, are using the sea salt. Um, there is a difference between the sea salt and the, and the table salt, for sure, in using, you know, if a, if a recipe calls for salt, and if it's a traditional Greek recipe, it's going to mean sea salt, not table salt. So, um, personally, I love sea salt. I love the kosher sea salt. There's a, something about the taste of that. It's a true 
virgin taste. It's not something that's been processed and gone through and, add, and other chemicals added to it or taken out of it. Um, it's really, really, I love it to cook with. The cucumber, I don't know if you saw, if you've seen them in uh, the stores, they have different cucumbers that are small, that are wrapped in plastic. They, you might have four or five to a, to a little package. Those are some of the best cucumbers you'll ever eat. I don't care for cucumbers. I hate them. Absolutely, just hate them. Um, <laughs> my husband would grow them, and I don't know why, because I never ate them. But uh, these little ones are, are a very mild taste. They don't have that cucumber taste to them, and they're very, very good. I use them in all our salads now. I stopped using the other cucumbers. They were bigger, and they had more seeds in them and more pethier. So uh, these cucumbers are, are fantastic. The cooking vessels that they used were made of clay. Um, they cooked over open flames and in, in clay ovens. Um, the methods were grilling, stewing, steaming, roasting, baking. They didn't do a lot of frying because they didn't have deep fryers, actually, tell you the truth, and they didn't have the oil to deep fry with. So there wasn't a lot of oil and, and deep frying that went on back then. One of their uh, main things that they do use, and I think I'm probably getting a, ahead of myself here, is um, olive oil. Olive oil's were amazing. The, the Greek olive oil is something that's just, the, the taste of it is just too different than, I don't know, it just tastes different than what does in uh, in Italy, you know, and you have different oils out of Italy that come from different regions and parts of Italy. So, um, and is it healthy? Is the, is the Greek diet healthy or not healthy? That's kind of, you kind of got to judge that for yourself. And I'm talking about the same Greek diet that they had many years ago back in ancient Greece as they do today, um, whether it's healthy or not. Um, they ate more fruits, more vegetables. They ate, uh, it was more in the raw form of foods. It wasn't today like uh, everything is processed, even in Greece today. Things are processed differently. Things are more convenient for, for people and families, you know, than what it used to be back in ancient Greece. Um, and they use olive oil, where we use oils, we use lard. We still use lard. Some, believe it or not, some places still use lard. We use different uh, different types of oils. That, and so, it, as it says, Americans are just the opposite of what Greek people are. We do everything supposedly wrong <laughs> than what Greek people do, you know, than what the Greeks do. So, okay, I think. Okay, these are, did you know, these are kind of cute. Um, the first cookbook was written by Greek uh, food gourmet. Yes, that's him. Um, anybody Greek in here? <laughs> what is it? Archistratos. Archistratos, okay. In 330 BC, which suggests that cooking has always been of an importance and significance in Greek society. Modern chefs owe the tradition of their tall white chef's hat to the Greeks in the Middle Ages. Uh, my, must, must, yes, brothers, were prepared food in the Greek Orthodox monasteries, wore tall white hats to distinguish them in their work from the regular monks who wore large black hats. To a large degree, vegetable cuisine can be traced to foods and recipes which originated in Greece. Many ingredients used in modern Greek cooking were unknown to the country until the Middle Ages. These include the potato, tomato, spinach, bananas, and others which came to Greece after the discovery of the Americas. Their origin, um, Greek food is simple and elegant, with flavors subtle to robust textures, smooth to crunchy, fresh and timeless, nutritious and healthy. Preparing and enjoying Greek food anywhere in the world is an adventurous journey to the cradle of civilization and the land of the gods of Olympus. Discovering, tasting, experiencing Greek food, truly one of the joys we can all share. And this is true wherever we go and whatever we do in life. If you look around the world, food is a common denominator. Food brings people together. Food has been known to uh, separate people as well. And uh, the old food fight is uh, always in play. You know, people like to have the food fights. And um, I was really excited to, to uh, research some of these things here that, they, that, that was there. I think that one's the end of the, yes, there's my references. So as far as the Greek food goes, last week in Pantera we had Greek food. And uh, I can't even remember some of the things that we had, but it, uh, we had baklava, which was unbelievable. We had the uh, uh, musica, which was really, really good. I was amazed at how well we could make that. And of course, if you had a true Greek person there, it probably wouldn't have been very good. They'd probably said, oh my gosh, this is not, where'd this one get this recipe at, you know? But um, 
it was very good and it was a lot of fun and it teaches the students um, wh when they cook internationally like that they learn about that country they learn why they're eating these things why did they only have certain ingredients you know and a lot of it was to do to the farming and the import and the export of foods um, throughout the world so um, I enjoy cooking and I enjoy researching different foods so um, that wraps up the food part of it. <laughs> okay, now I got the fun stuff, okay? Right here, my <laughs> hand. Okay, now if no one here, I have to, I do have to put this disclaimer in there. If no one here wants to learn about aphrodisiacs from, <laughs> from Greece, <laughs> please leave. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you, okay? <laughs> um, the Greeks have quite a few of them too, you know. Um, some of the things that you would think that, um, you invented or someone else invented uh, is not quite true. I had to literally print these off because there were so many of them I couldn't get them all on a PowerPoint. You know, we could have been here till the cows come home, you know. So um, one of the things that I wanted to read you, though, uh, that st stuck in my head and uh, somebody in this room just pointed out to me and I didn't realize because I didn't read that part of it, was uh, food and sex in the Bible. Now, I don't mean to bring religion into this, However, this goes back a long, long way. Unbelievable as it might sound, the Bible is one of the first books that used food with a sexual uh, connotation to describe lovers. Throughout the Song of Solomon, the male and female narrators compare one another to fruits and other foods. Isn't that funny? The man is compared to a bed of spices. Oh, really? <laughs> and the woman... Yeah, they're spicy, all right, right? Um, the woman... A woman's breasts are described as clusters of grapes. Now, tell me that you'll never look at the breasts the same again, you know, right? <laughs> what do I have here? You know, one, two clusters, three clusters, four, you know, right here. So um, they use figs, grapes, vines, and pomegranates to describe their love for each other. Other foods mentioned in the exchange include honey, milk, saffron, and cinnamon. And then just to quote a couple, George Bernard Shaw says, there is no love sincere than the love of food. And uh, Sheila Graham Food is the most primitive form of comfort. And this is so true. Don't you all find that true? So let's get back to the aphrodisiacs now. I just wanted to read that little part. Okay. Chocolate, wine, oysters, sure, but there's no more on this sexy list of aphrodisiacs than you probably realize, or there's more. One of those sexy food, sex foods is so potent in the days of the Egyptian pharaohs, priests were forbidden from eating it. Now, isn't that interesting? So they have one is aniseed. I um, think most people have, might have that in their cabinet, you know. Uh, it's a very popular aphrodisiac with many culinary uses. Uh, it's been used as aphrodisiac since the Greeks and the Romans were believed aniseed had special powers. Sucking on the seeds is said to increase your desire. I never thought of that, you know, when I bake bread, what we'll do with this <laughs> aniseed. <laughs> never thought everybody was sucking on the seeds, you know. And uh, uh, asparagus, given its uh, phallic shape, asparagus is frequently enjoyed as an aphrodisiac food. Feed your lover boiled or steamed spears for a sensuous experience. Okay, the vegetarian society suggests eating asparagus for three days for the most powerful effect. So what do you think is going to happen in that three days if you see your man friend or husband or whatever, you know, significant other? eating asparagus for three days. <laughs> you know what's coming, right? We don't have to go there, okay? Oh my goodness. And then uh, almond, a symbol of fertility throughout the ages. Aroma is, through to, is thought to induce passion in a female. So that's, I suppose that's why they're telling you to eat at least 15 or 20 almonds a day, right? So all us women can be passionate for the people eating the Asparagus. <laughs> I'm going to take it. Okay. Um, uh, basil is said to stimulate the sex drive and boost fertility. Is also said to produce a general sense of well-being for body and mind. Um, chili. Isn't this funny? Chili, a large amount of vitamin C, red, green, and cayenne pepper chilies stimulate circulation, which is why it is considered to be a potent aphrodisiac. So I guess if you eat aniseed, asparagus, and chili, watch out, right? <laughs> Spicy foods have long considered to be have long been considered to be sexual stimulants. There is some uh, scientific truth to this claim. 
and that foods that are heavily spiced often contain capsaicin, the active ingredient in cayenne pepper. Eating capsaicin can cause a psychological response, increased heart rate and metabolism, sometimes even sweating. This is quite similar to physical reactions experienced during sex, as this is not a sex ed class, I'm just telling you this, <laughs> so you know, okay? Okay, we have, uh, and some of these lists include chocolate and carrots and celery and coffee, cucumbers. Okay, we won't go to cucumbers. <laughs> Farro and figs and eggs and garlic. Um, this pungent member of the lily family, we're talking about garlic, has been used to treat a wide variety of illnesses from the common cold to heart disease. Garlic has been used as an aphrodisiac by the Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Chinese, and Japanese. Garlic mixed with lard used externally to bring on an... E Ooh, I didn't even know that word was in there. I don't think we better go there. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Disregard that whole thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Anybody wants to look at these later? <laughs> <Just> come, <laughs> come right up. <laughs> Please enjoy yourself. <laughs> Okay, pepper and pine nuts, um, rosemary, saffron and tomatoes. Okay, we have one more here. Truffles, vanilla, walnuts, and wine. A glass or two of wine can greatly enhance romantic interlude. Wine relaxes and helps to stimulate our senses. Drinking wine can be an erotic experience. Let your eyes feast on the color of the liquid. Caress the glass. Savor the taste on your lips. I don't know if you're making love to the wine or <laughs> is this so you're supposed to be thinking about your woman or your man friend or something. I don't know. Do remember that excessive alcohol will make you too drowsy for the after dinner romance. How many times have we been in that position, right? Okay. Yeah, I remember that now. I'm not that dumb. Okay. Um, a moderate amount of wine has been said to arouse, but much more than that amount will have with have the reverse effect. So, um, those are just some of the things for aphrodisiacs. And the Romans and, or the Greeks were quite. Um, you heard the old saying, "The Greek lover." They had it going on. They they have nothing on us. They know exactly what's going on, what's happening. So, that concludes my. Thank you. Anyone who would like to read this? Any questions? Any questions? I have a question for um, no, uh, ancient you. Egyptians. I mean, okay. these have, have been said in the history. I wasn't there to see that. But they say that Egypt was sure? the food basket of the area. Mm -hmm. So everybody would come and get food from there. Mm -hmm. So uh, and did you find in, in any of your research that uh, Egypt has anything to do with the Greek uh, civilization, food-wise or... You know, I read some things in there about the Egyptians and the Greeks, but um, I'm thinking what I, I'm thinking the what you're thinking is like it's a community market, like where they come and get different things. They, you know, if they don't have it, they can come and get there. You know, if they have an overabundance of it, you know, just almost like our community um, food banks and things here. You know, that's kind of similar to what they did back then. I wasn't there either, yeah, come to think about it, <laughs> I'm telling you, don't be thinking I was there. You weren't there. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, my goodness. Yes. So what is your favorite Greek recipe to make? My favorite one? The baklava. I love the baklava. Baklava wins. Yes, it's, got, it's <laughs> not good for you. It has a lot of sugar and honey, and it has a lot of nuts and the phyllo dough. and I love it, though. It's just... It's nice when it comes together, you're thinking, this is not going to come together because that fuel dough is so difficult to work with. But once it does, and, it, and you build up the layers, and then we cut into it, it's just amazing. But if every week you take a piece like two inches of something, it's, it wouldn't hurt you? or what's Moderation. Yeah, just a piece like this every... Yeah. And now, and this is what, moderation... Not moderation, okay? <laughs> right, Wafik? Is that what you're telling I me? I don't know about that. Now, another question about the uh, traditional fight between Greeks, Egyptians, Lebanese, uh, Israelis, Palestinians, about the origin of um, <clears throat> rolled or stuffed grape leaves and shawarma or gyros. Who, who is the origin? Did you read anything about that? Because everybody's fighting, say, we did it first, and you copied it for us. <laughs> Have you read anything? Well, Fik, I think you did more of your homework than I did mine because I don't. 
Honestly, I don't remember reading that. Okay. I mean, I know about the great believes and everything, but I, I don't, I didn't know. So maybe next uh, next uh, year we'll find us. We'll have yeah. Romans. I'll get back to you on that, though. <laughs> okay. I'll look you right up with that answer. Okay, any other questions for Kathy? Don't talk about the IPTGX. I'll just talk real loud. It, it, this is taping. Yeah. Now, I've never really been impressed with uh, people with very strong garlic breath. Uh -huh. So how does that one work, really? How does that, well, I can tell you this. If you all, anyone in here, has teenagers, garlic, the best form of birth control there is. Uh. Nobody <laughs> wants to get near someone who's got garlic breath. Not only that, but if you eat garlic, which some, some of us do, you know, as we get older, we eat more garlic. And because we have a tendency to believe it does do a lot of different things for um, diseases, you know, health-wise. But um, it not only does it come out through your breath, it comes out through the pores in your skin. And I mean, you can shower till the cows come home, you're still going to smell like a bulb of garlic, you know. So um, there, are, there are different pills you can take that don't have the garlic after effect now. You know, that's, they say is better just for, the, just for the smell. It's not necessarily better as far as health-wise goes. I think the only thing, the only way to to get the full effects of anything that you're eating for health is to eat the, the regular food or, you know, like vitamin D, you want to drink the milk and, and, you know, get out in the sun. But for the garlic, you want to eat the garlic itself, not not a pill, you know. It, I think I think American society, I know this is off the subject, but I think we're too much of a pill-taking society. Every time, you know, oh, well, take a pill. Oh, I got an ache. Oh, take a pill. Take a pill. We don't need that. We don't, we don't need it. Go back to regular everything. Dean, must you? Don't you think that... Uh, <laughs> To combat the garlic, you could also be um, chewing on any seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Make the best of both situations. Here we go again, <laughs> right? How red is my face now? <laughs> we could, and you could eat asparagus as well, and I'll drink the wine, and yes, we could. Yeah, so uh, if you start chewing on the anise seeds, though, we're going to be in trouble, right? Instead of the garlic, I think you better stick to the garlic, honey. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much for listening to me. I certainly appreciate it. It was so much fun here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.